It took an hour or more for the two to calm down and pull away from me at last. When they did, they left my duster wet, but I didn't mind at all. Auntie Vervain always told me that tears can heal a lot of things. It was holding them back that caused more pain. When they finally pulled away, I asked, You two gonna be okay? Bite answered first, her voice soft. I think so. Sorry I broke down like that. I just saw Wingnut lose it over seeing his mom, and it made me remember my own and the way she died. Yeah, at least you didn't have to hear it, Wingnut said, looking over at her. But I'm still sorry that you had to lose your mom, too. I'm sure you loved her as much as I did mine. I don't remember her much, honestly, Bite said, sniffing again. I was really young when she died, and now I... Then I remember things like something cooking in the kitchen in our small house, the scent of her leather armor next to the door smile. Silly things like that. My mom could make anything <clears throat> out of random stuff she found in the wasteland. She was a good cook. Not as good as dad, Wingnut said. Then looked over to me. What about you, Shadow? I tilted my head to one side. What about me? My mom's still alive. Yeah, but you lost her when you were young and just found her again. You know more than any pony else about how we feel, Wingnut said with a little smile. Well, I said, leaning back a little. I remember when we still lived in the uh, Crystal Empire. She used to come home from work and come find me right away. Not to check up on my health or anything like that, but just to sit and hold me. Even up to the day we'd left, she'd do that. I remember asking her once why she would come home and tell me things about her day at work or whatever she was really up to, and she'd just say, Sweetie, you're the only pony in the world that won't judge me and just love me for who I am. That was something I looked forward to, just seeing her and just listening to her as she talked. It helped the pain go away a little as I cleared my head. It was wonderful. She had a lot to deal with, and yet she took time to be with you, huh? Wingnut said. Yeah, she was a good mom for the most part. I saw my dad more than her before we left, but he was always worrying about me. She was too, but she just didn't show it as much. I said, what about you, Wingnut? You don't talk about them much. I'm sure you have a lot of happy memories. More than I do bad. I think the only bad things in our lives are when they died. My parents didn't fight much. They just loved to travel and trade. Mom loved to make things and fix things. Dad used to be a merc before he met my mom and would get into scraps now and then with other ponies, but he was good in the end. We never needed food. We always had caps and a place to sleep. It was a good life, he said. Bite? I asked, looking over at her. Like I said, I can't remember much about her. But Rusty was always around even before she died. He's my family now, and we've had lots of good and bad memories, but mostly good, she said with a smile. Wingnut's eyes went wide and looked back over at me. I just realized, Shadow, my mom, she said in that video that she was descended from Appleseed. Well, I remember her saying something about it now. You know what that means? I realized before you started crying, kiddo. I just didn't want to bring it up yet. You're the same as me, descended from the children of the night. My eyes went white again. Night Stalker said something like this would happen one day, but Zebra told him about it. The two fools looked at me like I was nuts, Bite saying, Did you hit your head or something? What are you talking about? In the memory orb I watched when I was on the bitter cob, Night Stalker told my distant grandfather, Dwarf Star, about something when he was told by an old zebra. A way to break the curse on our families? It had something to do with one of the descendants bringing the rest of the descendants of the Children of the Night together and taking down the Betrayer? Not sure how, but I mean there has to be something to it, right? I said, realizing after I spoke how stupid it all sounded. Bite and Wingnut both looked at me uh, like I'd lost it. 
Wingnut saying, You saw your great-grandfather talking about a curse and how to break it? I don't know, Shadow. It's all probably just a coincidence. I mean, there has to be a few of us out there that... And how would you know you had them all together? I agree with Wingnut. The curses aren't real. I've read plenty of books about them by famous unicorns who all say the same thing. There's dark and light magic, but a curse, especially one that goes on for generations, is just a bunch of crap made up by zebras to scare ponies. Simple as that. Bite added. I don't know, guys. I mean, if you look at the history of the families, a lot of bad stuff's happened to them. Mine included. I said, trying to defend my own thoughts. Yeah. Because we live in the post-apocalyptic wasteland, Shadow, Wingnut said. I just can't see it. Not unless I had proof. My ears drooped, followed by a sigh. Fine, but I still think I'm right. I know my uncle and mom will agree with me, too. Yeah, do whatever you want. But you think we can get to sleep? I can't hold up here forever, and a good night's rest will make us... Going through the city tomorrow a lot easier, Bite said, yawning in the middle of what she was saying. Okay, I'll drop it for now. Let's go see if we can find a room that's dust and bone free, I said, heading towards the door. Oh, I know how we can find a room, Wingnut said, as, uh, and then opened the door, yelling, Ginger! Barbie! Get in here! Within seconds, the two Miss Nannies were flying down the hall. Ginger bobbed up and down, saying excitedly, Yes, sir, what can we do for you today? Do you need a makeover, too, or maybe a hot bath? Bitch, the master does not need a makeover. I mean, like, look at him, he's already adorable, and it works for him. Reminds me of Master Little when he was a colt, before he turned into a dick. Barbie said, a gasping sound came from Ginger as she smacked the other bot with a claw arm, saying, I say, you shouldn't talk about Master Little like that. The poor dear went through so much, and he was always kind to us. He, like, totally made us go look for mares for him, even after he turned into a ghoul. He was like a dick, Barbie said, drifting closer to Wingnut. Sorry, sir. Ginger doesn't understand how the real world works. How can I help you? We need a room to stay in for the night, Wingnut said as Bite rolled around on the floor, laughing at the insane robots. Oh, I know the perfect place, Ginger said before zooming away, not even waiting for us. Luckily, Barbie seemed to have more of an intact mind for a robot. She just sighed and said, the Master Hugie Pony's room is still available and clean and has a big bed that should, like, totally work for you and your friends. His son left it alone after his father died in the big blasts. That should work. Lead the way. She did, going slower than Ginger, who we could hear making conversation with no pony down the halls. As we walked, I noticed how empty the house felt, and I remembered the security systems. Hey, Wingnut, I know you were able to get in here with Bite, but why didn't I get blasted when I came in? He looked like he was about to say something, but Barbie beat him to it. When Master Wingnut was let in at the gate, he was registered as the new owner of the property, since he is of the Ponyus bloodline, and no other registered members of the family are alive in the mansion itself. When he was registered, he was asked if the security should stay on to protect him. Wingnut interrupted. Yeah. They didn't tell me I was a ponyist, though, but the gate asked me that question, and I said sure, but if a short pony with a duster came in to let her in. Yes. The gate has a sophisticated security system made by Carrot Inc. It can see details of ponies coming and going. You showed up on the system and matched what Master Wingnut described, and we let you in. Barbie said, stopping next to a big set of double doors. So, like we're here... You may all stay in this room tonight, and if you need something to eat, there might be food that's still good in the pantry. Ginger was floating up and down next to the door. And you have no idea what it's been like stuck in this house with just Barbie. She's such a bitch. She needs to be reprogrammed, I swear. Who's she talking to? I asked. 
I've been trying to figure that out for a long time. Her mind is going, the poor girl, Barbie said. Then she smacked Ginger in the back of the orb-like body. <clears throat> Let's go back to our room and get you shut down for a bit. Ginger stopped bobbing, then her cameras turned towards Barbie. That sounds like a great idea. And with that, she was gone, following Bar Barbie. Those two are so weird, I said before pushing the door to the large room open, my eyes going wide. Oh yeah, this'll do just fine. The room was huge, with a king-sized four-poster bed, a large windows to each side, silk sheets that I couldn't believe were still there, a large dresser, and much more. The other two and I walked into the room, closing the door behind us. All of us in all the bedroom. Okay, this dude knew how to live, Bite said, running and jumping onto the bed, her small body bouncing a few times as she giggled happily, her kitty ears flying off of her head. Yeah, I agree. We should eat and get some rest? Wingnut asked as he walked over to the bed. Sounds like a plan to me. I think I have some food in my saddlebags, and I can see if there's any food around here. I said, setting my bags down. Sounds great, Wingnut said before jumping out of the bed with Bite. I just smiled and let them be fools. For all we knew, this was the only time they'd be able to act this way ever again. So I started my search. It didn't take me long to find a few snack cakes, some beans in a can, some cram, which I put away in my bags for Aura, and a few other things that we could use for food. We sat on the floor, eating till we couldn't anymore talking about the past and, for once, enjoying ourselves. An hour or so later, we were all passed out on the large bed, Wingnut and Bite both sleeping on either side of me. I had my shotgun propped next to my bed and Dreamwalker under the pillow just in case some pony got in. For the first time in a long time, I fell asleep without the help of a potion and barely had any nightmares. The next day, we packed our stuff, roamed around the house to see if we could find anything else we could use or sell, said goodbye to the two old, odd robots, and headed out the front door. I looked out at the city, which stretched out in front of us, and wondered how we'd ever make it to the Ministry. I knew two ways I could go. Either we could try to get to the university that Mr. Topps told me about and use this device he gave me to get in, if he was right about the location. Otherwise... I could use Mom's way to get in, go to the Bank of Equestria Tower, and get to the top of the building and find a synth that looked like one of my uncles. They were the ones who were told to let me in, somehow. The question was which uncle was I looking for, and even more, why would the Ministry make a synth of either of my uncles? It was a lot to think about, so I looked down at Wingnut and Bite, asking, So, where do you think we should go? From what I knew, we could either go to the university and try to get to the ministry from where Mr. Topps told me, or we can go to the Bank of Equestria Tower and find the synth waiting for us there. I think we need to find which one's closer, Bite said, pulling a large map out of her saddlebags and setting it on the ground. Found this on some dead pony not far from here. I looked down at it as she ran her hoof across the map. Then finally, Wingnut said, Well... There's the University of Los Alicorn. It's only a few blocks away from us. Bite spoke up next. And the tower's a bit further and right in the middle of downtown. So I think we better try to use Mr. Topps' way in. It's probably the smartest idea. Plus, we have no guarantee that the synth will be there. You've got a point. And with the Steel Rangers roaming around looking for the downed sky carriage, there's a good chance that we'll have problems with them if we get into the city. Speaking of the Steel Rangers, where are they located anyway? I asked. Not really sure, Wingnut said as he helped Bite roll the map up again. If I were to guess, I'd say they're either north of us or west. If anything, I'd say they're where the Palisade is hovering, so near the Applewood sign. That makes sense, I said, looking out and just seeing the airship in the distance hovering over the Applewood sign. I couldn't see Wolfbane leaving his ship too far out of sight. So we're heading to the UELA, then? Bite asked. 
yeah, I think it's the best idea we got. I just hope that this thing Mr. Topps gave me will work. I said, using the Mark II to take out what was labeled as a Ministry Teleporter Transport Tip on the screen. He said I put it in my pip buck, then I have no idea what to do. But as long as you two are next to me, it'll bring you to the Ministry with me. I hope that thing works. I've never heard of tech that works that can teleport before. Wingnut said. Zoe's eyes were big, looking at the small chip held in my magical grip. I guess there's only one way to find out. And, are you sure the others will be waiting for us there? I asked. So long as I got away from the Steel Rangers, then yeah. I said. Aura said she'd come look for us if it took longer than a day or two. But your mom said the Ministry wouldn't let them leave as soon as they entered for a while, so we'll see, I guess. Great. I still don't know why she pushed me off the sky carriage, I said with a sigh. Well, both of you keep your weapons ready, and let's get going. They both grinned up at me, and we were off, heading past the gates, which shut on their own when we left the property. Something made a clicking sound when they did giving me the impression that the security system was back up and running once again, protecting the old mansion from this dead city. With that, we headed towards where the UELA was supposed to be. As we walked, the sound of gunfire still echoed in the distance. But apart from that, it was quiet. It took us about half an hour to make our way out of the super wealthy neighborhood and start towards the northern part of the city, where the university was located. In the distance, I could just make out the old beach where I'd first woken up yesterday. I saw that the whole beach looked just as dead as where I'd been. The sand was black, the run-down war machines sitting off the coast and on the beach itself, skeletons all over the place. It was a ghost beach now, a place where only the dead should wander. I looked away and sighed at the nasty sight of the place. It was a shame the city couldn't be held together after the war. But that's just the way things go. Especially when you have groups like the Steel Rangers and the Enclave keeping ponies from your building. One day, maybe the city can be rebuilt. Once a pony, or more, takes care of the infestation of Steel Rangers. A pony like me? Though, that was just wishful thinking. I've done some amazing things, I know, but I couldn't stop all of them. Not on my own. I was going to need help. And maybe... Just maybe, if I played my cards right, I could find that help from groups like the Ministry, the NLR, and if I could fix the Enclave a little, maybe even them too. From what I could see, the Enclave itself wasn't that bad. It was the leaders who were the problem. Ponies like my father were the ones who were trying to make things better, and if they had the help they needed, maybe they could just, uh, in turn, help me get rid of the monsters that wore steel armor. Shadow, I think we're almost there, Bite said, pulling me from my thoughts. I looked up and saw that we were standing in front of a large, rusty iron archway that led to a mostly overgrown path that wound around a large yard with dead trees and stone benches and tables all around. Standing in the background was a building made of stone with University of Equestria, Las Alicorn Campus, over the main doors. There were a few skeletons around, and even more dead synths, from what I could tell. Even the helmet of an older set of power armor laying not far from the gate which led into the school. Down the way, I could see more buildings. Most of them either collapsed in on themselves or were in such disrepair that I knew it would be stupid to try and enter them. To my left, I could see what looked like an old hoofball court, a running track, and a dried-up pool. There was a sign that was mostly worn down, but... I could still read a few of the words on it. Dorms, science, and biology. Auditorium, student center, and the rest were so worn I couldn't read them. So what do we do now? Wingnut asked, looking like we ever looked at the massive school. I'm not sure. Mr. Topps never told me what to do once we got here. I said as I pulled the chip out again. I don't even know where this goes. Ah, you're hopeless, Bai said, coming over and pulling my Mark II closer to her. She pushed on something near the bottom of it and a little slot opened up. She then took the chip from my magic and popped it into the slot. It then closed and my pitbuck started doing something. Words flashed in my vision. 
I have no idea why your mother let you have that mark, too. You're hopeless with tech. I would have responded, but I was too distracted by all the crap running through my vision to think straight. After a minute, it stopped, and a message popped up on my Mark II. Connection to Courser TRD chip complete. Signal found. Status weak. Please move closer to signal for a full connection to be made. <laughs> uh, damn. What the hell does TRD mean? I asked, right as a 1.8% signal showed up to the left hoof corner of my vision. Not sure. Could be something like transportation relay detection or something like that, Wingnut said. So is it working? I guess. It said the signal was too weak and we need to get closer, I said, slowly walking into the yard and seeing the number go up to 3.5. I guess we'll just have to wander around until we get the right signal, I said. Let's get this over with. We have no idea how long it'll be until the Steel Rangers find us, Byte said. Good point, I said, walking towards the school's main building. We kept going, and I kept my eye on the signal as we did. Once we reached the front doors, it was still only at 22.9%. So we slowly pushed open the door and walked into the school. I made sure to keep Misery out while Byte pulled out her gravity gun, and Wingnut took out old Festus. The entryway was mostly just dusty with a moldy smell to it. Not a single dead pony or synth in sight at the front desk or near the office doors. The place was grand, though, with marble gargoyles looking down at us from the second-floor balcony, beautiful paintings on the walls, and, of course, a shit-ton of ministry posters lining any free space that they could find. I saw some of Fluttershy on them, a bunny on her head with words like, Help keep our soldiers safe. Join the Ministry of Peace, another with Twilight Sparkle, her mane done up in a tight bun holding some chemicals with her magic, saying, Join the Ministry of Arcane Sciences today. Help us find a way to fight back. Another of Rainbow Dash flying through the air in the Shadow Bolt's outfit, saying, Leaders in the sky and protectors of the air. Join the Ministry of Awesome, because that's what we are. Awesome. I noticed more, but stopped reading after seeing Rainbow Dash's knowing what kind of stuff her ministry really did behind the scenes. Then something caught my eye, or rather, the lack of something did. I see five of the six ministries here. Why isn't there any Ministry of Image? I asked. Wingnut shrugged. From what I heard, there isn't much for them. Rarity was the one who made all the posters for the other ministries, and she was in charge of confiscating of dangerous reading materials during the war. She probably had the smallest ministry out of them all, and trusted very few with the work she was doing. So, when she recruited, it was normally from the other five, not from the public. Because of that, no spy ever made it into her ministry, which is a good thing for the most part, I think. Some of the books she banned and took would have been a lot of information that would have helped the zebras. You know, I heard she had something to do with making those statuette things Shadow keeps finding... Byte said. I heard that too. Never seen any proof, though. Wingnut said as we pushed past the desks and headed towards the hallways that would take us towards the back area of the first level. I guess. Image had a lot of things going on, though. I said as we saw the signal reach 69. Nice. Wait, damn it. Now it was at 71.6? That joke was too fast. Not that I know of just had her hooves full with helping her friends in the country. She still found time to see them as best she could, though, Wingnut said. My mom used to love talking about the ministry mares. She idolized Applejack, said she was a strong and brave pony. She had to be running the Ministry of Wartime Technology, Byte said. I mean, hell, the Steel Rangers were started by her. Wait, what? She started the Steel Rangers? I asked in shock. No. Not in the way you're thinking, at least. They were a different group back then. Part of the army, but also part of the Ministry of Wartime Technology. Kind of like the Children of the Night. Only the public knew about them. She started the Steel Armor Project to protect ponies from being killed like her brother Big Mac was. 
It was a turning point in the war, too, Bites said, right as we reached the back of the building, looking at a door that led into a large office with the words Dean Woodstock on it. The signal was at 75.2%. The memory of Big Mac's death in Night Stalker's memory orb hit me then. Big Mac had died trying to protect the princess. A sniper shot from the cliffs, a zebra taking down a kind soul without even caring about the prey. I remembered Night Stalker flying up to those cliffs, but I never found the zebra in question. Just a mare in a dark uniform taking out zebra after zebra with deadly skill. I wonder what a zebra was able to get a shot off like that with such a skilled sniper so close by. Strange. I guess I can understand why she'd do that. It had to be hard to lose her brother, huh? I said, walking into the office. In a few feet, then stopping as the signal dropped to 68.9. Huh? The hell? I turned and walked back out, watching the signal go back up to 75.2%. What's wrong? The signal went down when I walked into the office, I said, turning down the hall and heading the other way. But the signal again dropped to 65.2, then to 55.9. I walked back to them. Something has to be wrong with this thing. The signal only goes up to 75.2. Wingnut looked up at the ceiling. Maybe we're in the wrong floor, but in the right spot? You think so? I asked. And the question is, do we go up or down? Bite said. Is there a basement here? I shrugged. Do I look like the university type? No, not really, she said, then started looking around. I don't see any stairs around here. Let's go back to the front and then head up those. If the signal goes down, once again we've reached this point, then we know we need to look for a basement. Works for me, I said, following her as she led us back down the hall to the entrance. It didn't take much time. This building was utterly abandoned. I expected to at least run into a few ghouls in here or something, but nothing was here. Oddly enough, apart from the Steel Rangers and a couple of synths, I hadn't seen any ghouls, raiders, fiends, bandits, or troublesome ponies at all. We reached the stairs to the front, and took them to the second floor, and started back towards the area we'd been in before. But when we got closer, the signal only reached 45.6%. We headed back again, and Byte wanted to check one more level just to be sure, but again, the signal just kept going down. It only reached 37.0% this time. I cursed as we turned again and started to head back. While we're up here, can we at least do some looting? Who knows when we'll get the chance again, and we need to start doing it more, Wingnut said. You know, that's a good point. I'm always so busy either running away from monsters or doing crazy things that I don't really look around much when I'm in places, I said, turning towards one of the office doors and opening it. We should be quick, though. We need to find the others. Bite rolled her eyes. Wasteland ponies are weird, says the pony who doesn't carry a real gun. I said, sticking my tongue out at her. It is a real gun, and it's better than that Dreamwalker one you have, she yelled as I walked into the room. Sure it is, I teased as I started looking around the room. We spent the next 20 minutes or so going through the top floors, mostly finding junk, and we did find a little ammo, some caps, weirdly enough, in a safe that had to be unlocked for Wingnut, ten Sparkle Colas, a bag of pre-war bits, a love letter to some pony named Bon Bon from a Lyra, and a memory orb. I took that right away, hoping it would be a normal memory and not a child of the night memory orb for once. We finished in the Dean's office. His safe was a little harder to crack, but my hacking and lockpicking skills were very good now, and I had to do both to get in. The safe was a safe within a safe. The first one opened from his terminal, the second needed a key. When I opened it, however, I only found two things. A note and a bag of... caps? Why would a pony from before the war hide caps in his office safe? I asked, looking over at the skeleton, missing a chunk of the top of its skull. A revolver was lying next to its hoof on the desk. And a nasty stain was on the wall. He must have blown his brains out when the mega spells went off. Maybe he was just crazy, 
Byte said, looking inside the bag as I read the note. To any pony who finds this treasure, I have spent the past five years hunting down these special bottle caps. I wanted to be the one who found them all and won the prize. Sadly, I am short a few still, and the war has turned. Los Alicorn will not last long, and the invasion force t have zebras uh, have put together. So, I sadly leave my hunt to whoever survives this and wants to see what that factory in Los Pegasus is hiding. Good luck to you, and may your hunt go better than my own. Dean Woodstock No way. It can't be. I said, right as Bice squeaked in amazement. Shadow, you won't believe this, she said, showing me the bag. Look! I looked down and saw it was full of the blue bottle star caps from Sunrise Sarsaparilla. I took the bag and almost screamed in delight. Aura was going to lose her mind at this. I placed them into my bag, saying, I can't wait to shore Aura. She's going to love this. How many are there? Wingnut asked as I placed them in my bags. I looked down at my Mark II, and my eyes went wide. There's 44. Aura has six, so we have all 50 we need to see what's in that factory. Well, that'll give us something else to look forward to when we see our friends again, Bice said with a grin. I just hope it's not some crap like jackets and stuff with Sunrise Sarsaparilla logos on it. Even if it is, at least it'll be something no pony else has ever done. I said with a smile, going from ear to ear. Aura was going to be so excited when I showed her this. Now I just have to survive the Ministry, Los Alicorn, and maybe the Steel Rangers, and get Aquila out of my body. Well, this room's done. Should we see if we can find the stairs so we can go down to the basement? Wingnut asked. Yeah. I think we've spent enough time here, and honestly, I want to get it over with. I think Aquila senses something's going on. I can feel her waking up slowly in my mind, I said, which is true. For the past few hours, it felt like she was starting to come closer to my mind, getting back to the peace as she normally sat. Since I woke up in Hoovington, I barely felt her, like she'd been hurt before I took over. It was kind of nice for a change, but now her strength was growing again, and I knew that soon she'd be back to her old self. How long do you think it'll take before she's back at her old strength? Bite asked, her eyes showing a little fear. Maybe a few hours? A day at most? It's hard to tell with her. She's good at hiding herself from me when she wants to. I know she's been waking for a while now. She did fire a new spell into my brain when we fought the Steel Rangers, but not much more than that, I said as we headed out of the office. For now, let's not worry about her. Let's just keep talk about Aquila to ourselves. It's the best way of hiding what's going on. I still don't know what the plan is. And that's the way it's going to stay. For all you know, this whole waking up in Las Alicorn is a trick. Bite said as she turned down the hall to check for stairs. Hmm, that's true. I really don't know anything for once. I kind of like it now that I think about it. I said before Wingnut went to check the other hall before we left the area. It only took a minute for Wingnut to yell, Found it! I waited for Bite to catch up, and we both headed towards the Colt, who was standing next to a plain-looking door with basement storage on it. I turned the knob, but, of course, it was locked. Would it kill the goddesses to give me one unlocked door? Hard to say, they're already dead, Bite teased. Haha, <laughs> you're so funny, Cookie Bite. I mocked as I pulled out my bobby pins and trusty screwdriver. The lock was pathetic took me less than three seconds to get the lock turned and to push the door open. Well, that was just sad. Hey, at least it's less time spent on a good lock, Bite said as she tried to go down first. No, I don't think so. I'm the adult here. I'll go first, I said, pushing her back with my magic and pulling out misery again. Since when, Bite said, but she let me go anyway. Hey, I got a year on you, so I'm the oldest. So bite me, bite, I said, but smiled right after. Wingnut just laughed as we headed down the dark stairs. Bite and I turned on our pip lights, letting the soft glow cut through the darkness. It wasn't a long walk down the stairs, with only another minute or so to find that we were in a large storage area. 
There were rows of sciency stuff, breakers and gems, and a few other odds and ends. There was also a lot of books, some hoofball equipment, a cot. Why a cot? Anyway, a cot and not much else. But the signal was now at 92.5%. Looks like we're almost there. Let's move further into the room. Leading the foals down one of the rows, I watched as the signal was going up, and in the end of the row, I could see the larger open area. 98.7, 99.1, 99.9. Almost there. Then something flew down the hall at me, screaming. A feral ghoul. It was a fucking ghoul! I screamed and brought misery up, and the damn thing's head met the sword with a squelching crunch, and blackish blood spraying out on the blade into my face. What the fuck? I yelled, pulling misery out of the now dead ghoul, the blood dripping off the sword like nothing. My face on the other hoof. <sighs> yeah. Fuck ghouls. That thing scared the shit out of me, Bite said. You okay, Shadow? Apart from now smelling like a dead body, I'm fine. Neither of you have a rag, I replied. I do. Lignus said, giving me one from his saddlebags. Why the hell was it down here? I asked. Probably locked himself inside, then turned into a ghoul when the radiation was still high on Las Alicorn. Stayed down here and went feral. Bite said as I cleaned my face off. Or at least tried to. I needed a bath. I needed one three days ago. Well, now that we have all had our jump scare out of the way, let's be on the lookout for more. I think we're almost there, I said, stepping over the ghoul and looking down at the name tag on the jumpsuit he was wearing. And as for you, Mop Bucket, fuck you. Wingnut and Bite wisely decided not to make fun of the moment, well, of me almost having a heart attack, and we moved on. Luckily, he seemed to be the only one here. That was until I turned my pip light on to see another ghoul standing casually next to me. Right as I brought up my sword, he said, Wait! And put up a hoof. Wait, did he seriously just say wait that casually? I stopped my attack and then said, Who the hell are you? He sniffed and scratched his mustached face with a hoof. Scruffy, the custodian. Wait a sec, you know this place is pretty much destroyed at the end of the war, right? I asked. Yep. He replied. And yet you're still here? Wingnut asked. Uh -huh. He replied again. Why haven't you left? I asked. He cleared his throat and said, Well, I reckon there's nothing better to do down here. Been down here quite a few years now, keeping the books and whatnot tidy. Mop bucket started slacking off a couple years back. Poor bastard didn't even see your sword coming. Sorry I killed your friend. I said. It's all right. He was getting all scruff his nerves anyway. Figure I'll clean him up in a bit. He said, sounding casual, like it was any other work day at the university. Why not just clean it up now? Bite asked. He lifted his hoof and looked at a broken watch, then cleared his throat and said, Scruff is on break. Oh, all right then. Enjoy the rest of your break then. Bite said. He smiled. Scruffy's gonna enjoy every minute. Anyway, y'all come back again sometime. Scruffy's good at poker. Uh, can do, I said as I continued on. A moment later, we reached a large open space and the signal reached 100. So I stopped right in the middle of the spot. Okay, so what do we do now? Bite asked. I looked at my pit buck and saw an icon had come up saying, Enter Ministry. I grinned. Both of you get next to me. This thing only goes out about a meter or so. I don't want you two left behind. Once they did as I asked, I clicked yes on my Mark II. Sometimes uh, something started to come out of my pit buck, like small electrical sparks that moved out in a dome around us. Wingnut and Bite both looked at it with wide eyes and awe as the white energy started to swirl around us. Then I felt something happening. It was like small needles were being pushed into my skin. A lot like when a limb is just waking up after falling asleep. 
Only it hurt a lot more than that. Ah, uh, Shadow? I don't like this. It hurts. Wingnut yelled. Before I could say anything, however, the energy shot back towards us, and the room we were in vanished in a flash of pain and bright white light. It only lasted about five seconds before all three of us were slammed into the ground in a dark gray metal floor. I winced, then got back to my hooves, looking around, trying to ignore the pain. My eyes grew wide as I saw we were in a small domed area with huge electrical pillars around us and a single open space that led towards a desk with a terminal on it and a glass shaft going from floor to ceiling. I... Never want to do that again, Bite said, getting up, her mane standing up a little. I agree, I said, then started heading towards the terminal. I remembered another thing I was told to do by Mr. Tops when I got in here, and I knew that once the Ministry found out we were here, they wouldn't give me another chance. So, knowing the two foals would catch up, I ran over to it. I was just about to start logging into the terminal when a feminine voice echoed around the room. It was light. It sounded older, but also rich and powerful like you'd expect from some pony who had a lot of power and knew it. Hello, Shadow Star, Wingnut, and Cookie Bite. We've been waiting for you for a long time. I'm glad you've made it here safe. Even if you did come through our emergency exit, the mayor said over some sort of hidden speaker system. Who are you? I asked, looking around. You'll find out in due time, Shadow Star. For now, welcome to the Ministry. And for now, you can call me Director. Footnote. Level up. New perk added. Shadow Walker. You've proven quite a little sneak around the city to avoid enemies. The shadows being your friend throughout. While sneaking, you are 20% less likely to be detected while in the cover of shadows.